Hello, everyone, and happy Wednesday. Welcome to this month's webinar, the Thought Leader Series, The Happy Healthy Nonprofit with Beth Cantor. My name is Kristen Romain, and I am a trainer for Sanford Institute of Philanthropy, and I am also a practicing development director out in the field at Virtue Lab where we implement a lot of the methods and tools that Beth has shared in her book and that she's going to be sharing with you live today. So I'm really excited to be moderating today's webinar. Before we get started, just a couple of notes. This is meant to be conversational, so this is an opportunity to talk to Beth herself about the methods that you may have read about in her book or you may be curious about. So make sure that you ask questions in the Q&A following the, and in, the Q&A following the presentation. Please also submit any questions that you have in the Q&A box using your GoToWebinar panel. In the days following the webinar, you will also receive an email with the slide deck and the recording so that you can review all the materials afterwards. You've got a cause, let's learn how to fund it. At the Sanford Institute of Philanthropy, we enhance fundraiser skills so that they can develop and sustain donor relationships to advance their cause in today's growing giving landscape through a proven contemporary curriculum. Presented by world-class nonprofit leaders like Beth, best-in-class faculty, and world-renowned philanthropists. Today, we wanna to recognize all of our affiliate partners who provide training and education to funder, fundraisers nationally. Our affiliates are also holding viewing parties all across the country right now. So shout out to our partners in Albany State University, City University of Seattle, East Carolina University, Long Island University, Maricopa Community College District, and National University. Be sure to check out the map to find an institute in your community. Also, if you're on social media, be sure to give us a shout out using the hashtag SIP webinar and tag us and Beth. Now I'm pleased to introduce today's presenter, Beth Cantor, master trainer, speaker, and author. Beth is an internationally recognized thought leader in networks, digital transformation, philanthropy, well being in the workplace, and training. She has over 35 years working in the nonprofit sector in capacity building and has facilitated trainings for thousands of social change activists and nonprofits on every continent in the world. She's an in-demand keynote speaker and workshop leader. Named one of the most influential women in technology by Fast Company and one of Business Week's Voices of Innovation for Social Media, Beth was also the visiting scholar at the David and Lucille Packard Foundation from 2009 to 2013. She's an author of the award-winning book, Network Nonprofit, and The Happy Healthy Nonprofit, Strategies for Impact Without Burnout. She also writes a blog, Beth's blog, and her clients include foundations, government agencies, and nonprofit organizations. Beth, we are so happy to have you here, and I'm really excited to talk about this topic with you today. Oh, thank you so much uh, to the Sanford Institute of uh, Philanthropy for inviting me. And anytime I get a chance to have you as my moderator or to collaborate with you, Kristen, is a pure joy. So um, thank you, everybody. And um, so on uh, today's webinar, I'm going to be covering uh, three different topics. And um, the first is going to be, uh, you know, the idea that um, well-being in the workplace really begins with your own self-care and building your personal resilience and learning the techniques to avoid burnout by managing uh, fundraiser stress. And we know fundraisers have a lot of stress. Um, so that's topic one. Topic two, we're going to talk about the benefits of foster fostering a culture of well-being. And finally, some practical and low-cost ways of activating a culture of well-being at your nonprofit. Um, you'll note that there is a link there I have uh, where you can find uh, my slides, the handouts that I'm going to be referencing throughout this webinar. I'm going to be referencing a lot of research studies and other resources and further reading. All of that is linked off of uh, this URL, and that will be sent to you uh, following the um, session. I'm going to encourage you 
uh, you know, to ask your questions as we go. Um, we want to try to uh, be as conversational as possible. So um, I want to find out a little bit about you and your organization's approach to well-being in the workplace. And we're going to do a poll. And you're going to see um, – uh, but you get to answer it with one or four choices. And the first choice is, is it not discussed at all? Um, are employees encouraged to do it on their own? Um, are there periodic organized organizational activities for well-being? Or um, does your nonprofit have a comprehensive plan and strategy and policy about well-being in the workplace? So I guess we're going to launch that poll. So you should have a poll that's popping up on your screen and make sure that you respond to the poll. We'll give you just a few seconds and then we'll be reporting the results back to that. Great. You know, Chris and I ask this question at many, many different trainings and I'm always curious to see what the breakout of the audience is. Absolutely. And really curious. I know. <laughs> How many guesses? <laughs> I know. It's like, ooh. <laughs> yeah, I think I... It, Probably, I would be curious if it depends on the size of the organization, too. Yeah, you know, if, yes, if a lot of organizations are a little, are they more, you know, talkative about it or less? So, and you'd be surprised some large organizations don't have those plans. Um, sometimes it's the type of organization and the type of work. I mean, I find healthcare organizations, not surprisingly, do have comprehensive um, strategies. So, All right, so it um, looks like our poll results are back, and it looks like 16% are saying that it's not discussed. 39% uh, are saying that employees are encouraged to do it on their own. 36% uh, there are periodic activities for wellness and well-being, and only 9% have a strategy or plan in place for a comprehensive program. So do those results surprise you, Beth? Um, no, it's, it's it's somewhat typical. Um, uh, I, I see few, always see fewer, depending on the audience, in that upper level where people have, you know, a plan and um, and a lot in the middle. Um, and that's great. No matter what level you're on, I'm sure that you're going to get uh, a lot of um, information and practical tips from today's webinar. I encourage you to again ask questions, share your experience. Um, I, w I especially want to hear from those 9%. They're pro um, they can come on up and be uh, present along with me. <laughs> um, so when I do uh, this workshop in a face-to-face -face, uh, setting, I like to start out with an icebreaker that gives um, a practical uh, practice around um, being personally resilient, okay? So a lot of time our stress can be self-inflicted because we are playing a negative headset inside our brains. Oh my God, the big proposals do. Oh, it's, oh my God, I can't get this. I can't bend the donor said no. Oh my God. And that loop kind of creates inner stress or else maybe there's external circumstances that you can't control and you're letting those get to you. So, um, so the important thing is sort of step back, recognize it and pop up the volume on positive ideas and inspiration. So when, um, when I do this face-to-face, -face, I usually have people answer this question in a small group or in a share pair. Um, so what I would like to do is give you a minute or two to think about um, the answer to this, these two questions. Um, and these are what experience first led you into the nonprofit sector, doing professional work in the nonprofit sector? Or maybe what is it about the organization or program that you're raising money for that inspires you? Okay, so think about, think about that for a moment. And, um, and I'm, uh, not to put you on the spot, Chris, and what is it, you know, why do you get inspired? What makes you inspired about the work that you do? Yeah, so just recently, uh, my organization is raising money towards climate change, and we fund early stage innovators. And so just recently, I got to actually go out and spend time in the field with some of the innovators as they were testing out these new technologies. And it just really inspired me because it made me feel like the work that we're doing is so impactful on the world. And being able to just see that hands-on. Initially, I didn't want to take the time to do that, and it helped so much with my other work, just being able to get inspired again. So 
that's awesome. And I think what happens a lot with fundraisers is that sometimes we focus on the dollars and I'm not saying those aren't important. They are important. And then, but we lose sight of the programs and the organizations and the good work that we're all doing and having field trips and connecting with the people actually doing the work or who have benefited from the work can keep you inspired. And also when you feel like you're getting stressed um, to replay those stories in your head and think about and rekindle that um, inspiration. So just a tactical, uh, a, a, a technique that can help you in times of stress when you're feeling stressed is to turn around that headset and think about uh, uh, what inspires you about the uh, program that you're fundraising for. Um, so as I click through, <laughs> Let me click. Um, let me tell you a little bit uh, about my story about why I wrote a book about self-care. Um, it's you know, unknown for networks and digital strategy, but um, this book has been sort of a, a passion project for me, and I'll tell you why. Um, uh, you know, a little while ago, I went to see my doctor, and I got all those tests done, uh, you know, cholesterol, blood pressure, all of those, and my results came back. And I, my triglycerides were up at 399. If you know anything about um, uh, those tests, less than 150 is in the healthy range. So obviously, I was probably eating too many bacon cheeseburgers. Um, my only form of exercise was sitting in front of the TV and clicking on the remote. Uh, maybe some of that was involved, but I'm not going to talk about that. Um, but mostly, I was doing way too much of this. I was overworking. I was working nights and weekends. I was afraid to take time off because, oh, the work is so important. I can't take time off. Um, I was cheating myself out of a good night's sleep, you know, working at night, doing emails before bed, thinking, you know, I'll sleep when I die, um, and no vacation or downtime. And so my doctor said to me, you know, Beth, um, if, you, um, if you just went out and took a walk every day, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, that would help you so much. And of course, you know, I'd heard this advice and I tried really hard not to roll my eyes, but then I decided, okay, I'm going to strap on a Fitbit. I don't know how many of you have Fitbits and I'm going to start walking. At first it was kind of pitiful, but every day I did a little bit more until I was walking about 10,000 steps regularly, sometimes even more. And what's so much fun about the Fitbit, if any of you have one, it's sort of a fancy digital pedometer, it measures your steps and your activity, is that you can actually race against your colleagues. You could, they have a leaderboard and you can um, uh, race and see who gets the most steps. And there you see, I'm number three on the leaderboard and uh, it's midnight, I get up and I'm kind of walking around the room and my family's saying, what are you doing? I'm saying, well, I'm number three on the leaderboard, I can't lose. Um, I went back to my a doctor in a few months and got my tests done and they all came down to the normal range. So I was lucky uh, because it wasn't related to genetics. It was really related to lifestyle. I was able to bring myself back to better health. And something else happened. I was able to really focus. I, even though I was out walking, I was getting a lot of work done. I was just cruising through those proposals. I wasn't typing the same sentence a couple times. And I was, feel, I was happier <laughs> and every, people were noticing it. And, um, and I got really excited about this notion that, you know, taking care of yourself, whether that's walking, getting a good night's sleep, whatever it is, is really part of doing the work because it helps you get better results. So when I went around talking to my nonprofit co colleagues, they would say to me, where do you find the time in your work day? And that's the point that it's not something that you find the time to do in your work day or that you do after work. You can easily weave it into the way that you work and it'll pay you back in, in getting better results and being more resilient and more sustainable in your, in your job and in your work in the nonprofit field. So I started to do the research and the first um, study I came across was from uh, uh, Stanford University, which is right down the road from me. I'm up here in Silicon Valley. And it was a um, study about uh, the benefits of walking meetings for your team. And the key benefit is that it improves creativity. It, it provides a boost of inspiration. You can get outside. The team is walking. You're out of like sort of sitting around the, the conference table and you're actually generating better ideas. I mean, who doesn't want their fundraising team to be innovative? Um, the other study I came across uh, comes from the University of Illinois from Dr. Chuck Hillman. And um, he was actually scanning brains before 
and after taking a, um, a 20 minute walk. So the one that you see on the left, that's kind of dark and a little grumpy and kind of not, not really writing that proposal, that brain's been sitting quietly for 20 minutes. The one on the right where the synapses are all lit up and that person's getting a lot of work done and is in a great mood has taken a 20 minute walk. So what I'd like to ask all of you to consider is what brain do you think is in best service to, to your work as a fundraiser and to the people that are ultimately being served by your organization's programs? The one on the left that's kind of dark and a little grumpy or the one on the right that's happy and productive and, and getting great ideas around grant proposals and writing them up. So, um, the other thing that happened along the way is that I went to a convening um, of networks and social change movements, and that's where I met um, Alan, who was from the Black Lives Matter chapter that was in New York City, and he was telling the story that really struck me. He was talking about uh, the summer of 2015, it was the height of Ferguson, and these activists were coming in to do their work, and they would, um, do a check-in on their meetings. You know, how's everyone feeling before they actually got into the business part of the meeting? And everyone was talking about how stressed and angry and, uh, you know, stressed they were. And Alan sort of said, well, then why are we doing this work? And so they decided that they needed to each start to take care of themselves and create self-care plans and then to create um, a community of themselves where they are accountable to each other around this well-being as part of doing the work. So for me, this was, taking self-care, which is really important, and creating we care. So that's, those are the topics that, that are in the book, and that's what I'm going to um, talk to you about, um, both um, self-care and, um, and then bringing well-being into the work, because you need both ends. So um, I don't know how many of you are poetry fans, but one of my uh, favorite poets is Audre Lorde, and... Um, and she has a wonderful quote, um, uh, caring for myself is not self-indulgence, it's self-preservation, and that is an act of political warfare. So I want you to let go of the, you know, this notion that self-care, it's a luxury, I feel guilty if I take care of myself. No, it's, uh, it's not, because uh, it is the way that will help you sustain your work. Um, I love this quote, and I've, one of my self-care things in the morning that I like to do, I like writing by hand and different pens and markers. And I, what I do every morning for 10 minutes is I write in handwriting inspirational quotes that sort of guide my work and um, keep me inspired. So another self-care uh, little tip and technique. So the first step to self-care is really understanding what burnout is. And you'll see there on the screen that the official definition of burnout from the World Health Organization is that burnout is a state of emotional, mental, and physical exhaustion that occurs when we feel overwhelmed by too many demands, too few resources, and too little recovery time. And most recently, the World Health Organization said that workplace burnout is an official medical diagnosis and that organizations have a responsibility to make sure that, they're, uh, that they are keeping a culture of well-being, that there's a, a camaraderie in the workplace, that, that the, the work is not overburdensome for any one person, that employees have healthy work-life balance, um, and that this is real. So, um, so burnout is real, um, and the first step to not burning out is understanding what those symptoms are of burnout, because sometimes, you know, we may, you know, we may get sick, or we may have some aches and pains, or our attitude may change, and we attribute it to something else, not to burnout. So the symptoms are all around, they could be physical, emotional, they could be um, around detachment and being cynical, and then eventually that affects your work, your work, work productivity. So in, we did interviews with thousands of nonprofit professionals to hear their burnout stories and their symptoms, and we came up with the nonprofit uh, burnout assessment, it's called the passion fatigue assessment, because the first step is you are passion driven. Being passion driven, you love what you do. Um, you're inspired, you're doing that work, and, but you're not taking breaks. But, um, and, and, um, and one might be fooled into thinking that this can last forever, but passion is not a sustainable resource. Um, if you don't learn self-care and personal resilience, you get into passion waning. And passion waning is just 
you know, you just, you know, don't feel as motivated to do the work. Um, it's a little bit more difficult, um, uh, but you push through anyway. And here, if you don't practice self-care, uh, you get into passion challenge. And here you might be feeling some aches and pains. You might be getting sick. Um, and here, if you don't actually pause and do some self-care, you might get into that last stage, which is burnout, um, uh, uh, passion depleted. And here, you're not good to anybody, uh, yourself, your organization, or the people that you serve in your organization. So uh, we're not going to do it now. I usually do this in workshops, but in your handouts, you will see the nonprofit uh, burnout assessment. So you take, uh, you answer those questions. It's designed to help you um, understand what the symptoms of burnout are and figure out what stage that you're in. Um, and usually when I do these workshops, I see people in all across the board, usually in the middle, usually at that passion waiting stage and sometimes at that passion challenge. Um, so uh, that's the first thing, understand the symptoms of burnout. And here is a tool to help you do that. The second thing is to get some self-awareness and understand what your personal chaos index is. Now, a personal chaos index, this comes from the addiction literature. And so when you're addicted to something, you lose sight of everything else in the world and certain behaviors start to manifest themselves. So, and it's called the personal chaos index. So, so when I'm stressed out, my personal chaos index is dirty dishes in the sink. Okay, and sadly, those are my dishes. And the reason that, um, that this is my personal chaos index is because I like to start my day with a clean sink. You know, wash the dishes off, put them in the dishwasher, and uh, start my day. It takes five minutes, right? Um, but if I see this at the end of the day, when I come home, you know, it means that I've told myself I'm too busy to do my, to do the dishes or to practice self care. So I'd like you to take a moment to pause and just think about what is your personal chaos index? What is the behavior? Uh, my co-author forgets her keys when she uh, leaves the house or another colleague told me who lives in DC, they forget their Metro card. So forgetfulness. Um, other people have said, you know, laundry piles up or the, my inbox piles up in my email. Kristen, do you have a personal chaos index? Yeah, I found that if I start to really isolate from my family, um, that it's usually because I'm completely burnt out. Um, and so sometimes it'll be things like just missing going to Chuck E. Cheese on Friday. <laughs> you know, if I'm late and I don't make it to Chuck E. Cheese with my family on Friday, that's that's an indicator to me that i am got my priorities not in place, so. Uh, that's a good one. So what I would challenge everyone to do is to identify your personal chaos index, takes a little self-awareness, write it down on a sticky note, and pause when you see that behavior manifest itself and understand that you need to slow down and realign and think about self-care. So, um, okay, so education about the symptoms of burnout, awareness around, uh, you know, when you are stressed, when they, what, what your personal chaos index is. And then the other thing is really understanding what your stress triggers are. What's the single biggest cause of your stress and work? And also understanding, is it something you can control? you know, um, by putting some boundaries around it, um, by managing it a little bit, um, usually, um, it, or is it your view about something, um, or is it something completely external that you can't control and that you just need to accept that. So um, when I do a workshop, I usually have people share what their stress triggers are. And it's always so hard to pull people out of that because people feel it's very cathartic. So one of the ways of managing your stress triggers once you've identified them is having someone to talk to. And, um, and there, there's this, uh, a most recent study about workplace well-being that if people who felt that they had a friend at work who they could talk to um, are, are the most engaged and the most happiest at work. Um, so maybe you have uh, someone in your family, maybe you have a professional colleague at another organization, maybe you have a therapist or whatever, um, but being able to talk about it. Another um, way to manage stress is also journaling, doing some, you know, straight journaling, talk, journaling around your stress, writing it down, thinking about it, um, and thinking about ways to manage it. So we're going to do another poll. Um, uh, 
I want to know, uh, I've done this uh, discussion many, many, many times, and it seems like stress in the nonprofit workplace for fundraisers seems to boil down into a couple of patterns. So that's what I'd like to know about. Is your uh, stress trigger due to communication or collaborations with others, people not listening, a lack of clarity? Self-inflicted, that you say too much, I say yes too much, perfectionism, not delegating. Is it workplace norms, like surprise deadlines uh, that are popping up, um, you know, on, on, a, on a regular uh, basis? Or is it uh, distractions or micromanagement, um, workplace norms? Um, the next one, let's see if we can get this to click. Uh, technology related, is it, you know, too many emails, too many, you know, too many inputs, too much with collaboration software? Um, or... Is it external, beyond your control? Um, and we all know what those sorts of things are, something that's happening in the news, um, something completely external to your own work, but it's causing you stress? Or is it something other? Um, and if it is other, you know, uh, share that in the Q&A if you want. So let's watch the poll. <laughs> All right, Kristen, do we have the poll up? It's up. We're just waiting for some responses. Um, I'm really interested to see what people respond here. Um, I've been doing some reflection myself and finding that sometimes mine are more self-inflicted. <laughs> um, <laughs> and sometimes just taking that moment to ask yourself, is this a real deadline or is this a you know, self-imposed deadline or, or self-imposed um, requirement because I think we do have a lot of you know high expectations for ourselves in the field that's not a bad thing but um, sometimes it can de-escalate stress you know just knowing Absolutely. that you're putting it on yourself a little bit <laughs> yes I All think right. a lot of us a lot of us have been there <laughs> yeah so it looks so what like do we have Based on the results, it looks like um, most of the stress triggers, 31% are due to communication or collaboration with others, 27% uh, are self-inflicted, 24% are based on workplace norms, only 1% um, are technology related, and about 17% are external beyond um, their control. Oh, that's great. So it's really important to understand like what you control and what you can't control and putting boundaries around that external stuff. Um, I, I, I see a lot workplace communication and collaboration. That is a big, uh, that, ha that always seems to be the largest, um, uh, most common response that I hear. And actually I just wrote a blog post this morning <laughs> on my blog, just in anticipation of this, that does give a few tips um, and some articles to read um, on how to manage some of these uh, stressors. And so I'd encourage you to read that. I think you're a great tip, Kristen, of just, um, if it's self-inflicted, to ask yourself, is it a real deadline or is it self-imposed? So, so we've talked about burnout, uh, what it is, how to recognize the symptoms, how to develop some self-awareness around when you're stressed, and then also understanding what's causing your stress. So let's talk about self-care. So. It's more than just health, but includes any deliberate and consistent habits you create to enhance your overall well-being. So I like to think about it, and we wrote about this in the book, that it's sort of in these five different areas. It's our relationship with ourselves, um, and that's health, and um, you know, healthy habits, getting enough sleep, eating healthy foods, um, creativity, spiritualness, um, all of those things. Um, our relationship with others, and that just came up, so uh, maybe self-care is around getting some professional development about how to up manage or side manage or deal with difficult people or just how to set boundaries. Um, another area is the environment. That's your office space or getting outside, your relationship with work, which we will talk about, and of course, our relationship with technology. Um, so, um, <clears throat> so I'm just going to give you five highly practical tips to weave self-care into your workday these things aren't, they're not difficult to do, they're not expensive, um, they're small little steps um, to help you get started. So my first tip is to protect your sleep. 
So if your sleep looks like this, if you're looking at your device before bedtime, that's disrupting uh, circadian rhythms and, and it's preventing you the onset of melatonin, which helps for productive sleep. And um, when you don't get enough um, sleep, you, you can't function at your best and you tend to get cranky. And most humans uh, between 18 and 64 need between six and eight hours of sleep per night. According to a recently released landmark study, um, it used to be seven to nine hours, but it's shifted down to six to eight. And um, so have a calm bedtime routine. Um, that might be making a cup of tea, um, taking a bath, reading you know, your kids a story, or reading, reading a novel. Um, shift from that to maybe answering emails at night. And as I mentioned before, uh, if you're, you are on your devices right before bedtime, it's, it's not, it doesn't lead to a healthy good night's sleep, and that's because of the light that's on your device, which is measured in kelvins. And you'll note there that a bright sunny day is somewhere around 6,500 kelvins, 6,000 kelvins, and your iPhone 6 is 7,100 kelvins. So what you're doing by looking at those emails before bed or news or, or whatever, it's waking your brain up and it's telling you it's daytime and it's delaying um, a good night's sleep. Also, even if you use some of the, the screen uh, uh, devices that allow you to have less Kelvins in your device, it's not scientifically proven. And also if you're reading like about a work email that just kind of pops up after hours about a big proposal that's due tomor tomorrow out of the blue, that's not gonna help you get a good night's sleep. Okay, Paul Moore. I just transitioned to using uh, the feature on my phone that makes it go monochrome at a certain time of night. And that's really helped me to not sit and scroll on my phone um, because it turns to black and white. <laughs> yes, it makes it less, uh, less engaging and addicting. And actually, we'll talk about that in a moment. So scrolling more, actually taking your lunch break. Does your, do you, are you using your keyboard, computer keyboard tray as a lunch, keyboard, keyboard as a lunch tray? Get out and take that walk at lunchtime. You'll, you'll avoid the afternoon slump, even if it's for 10 or 15 minutes. I know lots of nonprofit folks have started doing this, and they've taken a novel with them, and they've gone out of the office, taken a walk, gone sit in the park, read a few pages of the novel, and come back uh, to work. So it's giving your brain a break, and you'll feel refreshed. So I say stroll more at lunchtime. And leave that mobile phone at home. Um, We've seen a big increase in um, pedestrian accidents due to something that's called distracted walking. And you know what that is. Um, and so uh, what you wanna do is to be able to take a break from those mobile phones. So um, if you, do you think you spend too much time on your mobile phone? Virtually raise your hand. <laughs> I mean, I have at different points in my life. What about you, Kristen? <laughs> Absolutely. I'm trying to get much better about it, but it's it's definitely one of those things that it's hard to break the habit unless you start to put it just in a different place and get it away. <laughs> yeah, so I think the first thing to habit change is having self-awareness. And, um, and if you're on an iPhone, there is a, a little uh, feature called screen time. And you can actually look and see how much time you are spending on your mobile phone. And it also will give a breakdown of the different types of apps that you tend to be using. And take a look at that and see how much time is actually productivity or work related versus entertainment versus social networking. And really start to think about that and put some boundaries around your phone use. And so what's happening um, with this is not necessarily your, um, your fault. Interface designers designed for something called a ludic loop which is uh, getting involved in a repetitive activity because every now and then something pleasurable happens like a slot machine. And so the researchers that have looked at this have discovered that they've actually hooked people's brains up to uh, monitoring and they give them uh, technology, mobile phone or laptop, and they actually look and see what's going on physiologically. And so what happens is the stress from technology use, it comes from a thought that comes into your head that says, oh, I should check my email or what's happening on Facebook. And that thought releases stress hormones. And the only way to reduce the stress hormones is to pick up your phone and that releases endorphins. And there you go, you're in a ludic loop. So take control of your mobile phone. And um, this link over on uh, Human Tech has 
pages of tips, just like the one that Kristen mentioned earlier about going grayscale. These are all different ways that you can learn to kind of, um, you know, put some boundaries around your mobile phone use and reduce that stress. My favorite is scrambling the apps every so often because your thumbs have memory and you aren't even thinking about it and all of a sudden you're looking at your email. So when you scramble your apps, you like have a moment of panic because you can't find it and then you realize, oh yeah, I'm trying to not look, why am I looking, why did I pick up my phone? Why am I going into email? Gee, it's 10 o'clock at night on a Friday night. I don't need to be doing this. <laughs> so uh, one of the things that I did is that I lived in one of these techniques each month to test it out, see if it worked for me, and then added something else. And this has really helped me go from ha having too much phone to the right amount. And finally, there's two other tips. One is finding quiet time in your day. And I love this um, graphic. It was circulating on Facebook at one point. And this is a person in an office and they put a sign on their back that says, I'm on a tight schedule today, do not disturb. You know, exceptions in case of emergency are permitted. Am I on fire and don't know it? Are you on fire? Am I the only one who can put you out? Are you a pizza? The zombie apocalypse is here. Um, you don't really have to go into um, such lengths as this, but maybe just even scheduling quiet time on your calendar so you can do that solo work and get things done. It's not good for our nervous systems to have back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back meetings and to be running around and doing our email and just not having that time to take a breath or to think or to even focus on getting work that requires just our brains on it. Um, and then what happens, it just leads to overwork because then the only quiet time we have is after hours when that's non-work time and we're doing this work at home. So time boxing it, put block out solo time on your calendar if you can for that. And also taking a real break, it's called a vacation. There are research study after research study. There is a site called the Time Off Product Project that's looked at the impact on workplace productivity of taking your full vacation. A vacation is not going out and being on a kayak. That's me with my mobile phone, checking my email or taking work calls. It's really shutting down and taking a break. Um, and you'll come back more fresh and you will uh, be more productive. So those are some things around um, self-care, some simple tips. I don't know, Kristen, if there were any questions that came up about self-care? There some are the actually, um, there's a couple about from the uh, National University Viewing Party. Uh, they're asking about burnout and fatigue. They love the checklists, um, but this is more for staff. Do you have checklists for donors when donors are fatigued with their ask proposals? So it's more of a fundraising question. But Ooh, question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and isn't um, isn't there in uh, the book <laughs> somehow I recall something in the book around that? Yes, absolutely. Um, so and, and you you're going to share the URL because the book's online right yeah. now and you can order yeah. it and you can also get a free chapter. So I would definitely go and look at the cost selling book because there's lots of great advice around that. But um, but you know. Uh, I would think that asking too much is not a good idea without um, providing cultivation and engagement. So those are some techniques about self-care. If you're developing your self-care plan, I think it's important to pick the things that you want to do. And in the materials, there is a self-care um, template. Um, there's an example of a self-care plan. Uh, when I do workshops, I have people actually spend time thinking about what is it they want to do for their own self-care and come up with some goals and some action steps that might look something like this. So creating a plan is one thing, but actually putting it into practice and creating new self-care habits that actually stick is another. And so one of my favorite habit theorists is right down the road at Stanford University, and uh, it's BJ Fogg, and he uh, has a, a framework that he's worked with called Tiny Habits. Um, it's coming out, he's actually publishing a book in December, I highly recommend it. And tiny habits works like this. If you really want to institute new habits in your life, you want to make them tiny. You want to find a prompt or a trigger or a time in your routine to do it. And then you train the cycle. So for me, um, I wanted to start to, to practice mindfulness at work. And so I got the tiny part. Some colleagues said to me, you know, 
you can use headspace and you can do these meditations and just take a break during your day and do it. So I made it tiny, but I didn't do it. And the reason was I didn't find the right trigger to actually prompt me to do this new habit. So what I did is I realized is that I make coffee every morning and why not? And as I, you know, push that button and I'm sort of impatient for the coffee to brew, why don't I just stand or sit in front of the coffee machine and do a coffee meditation, some deep breathing. And so that was the right trigger for me. And then I made it a habit. Then I felt the benefits. And then I was able to actually introduce it um, and take mindfulness breaks um, during the day at, at work. And those have really helped, really stepping away from a stressful meeting or about to dive into a, you know, a big deliverable, you know, taking a big deep breath and some quiet really helps um, gather your thoughts. So what I'd like folks to do is just maybe take out a pen and paper if you're there. Write this down. Being, I like writing because writing makes gives you uh, the intention. And write down uh, what is one self-care habit that you can build into your work and life starting this week? And how can you make it tiny? And what is your prompt? So give folks a few minutes. To reflect on that. I don't know if there's any other questions that bubbled up, Kristen, or if you have some questions. So there's one question here asking about um, how all this wellness can really help with innovative fundraising, but do you have any examples of what would be um, improving the ROI, like how you could really demonstrate that improving the ROI on innovative fundraising? Okay, so uh, so we're, and we're, this is a great lead-in to well-being in the workplace, um, but uh, the ROI uh, manifests itself in a lot of different ways. Um, so at first, there's actually uh, cost savings, okay, because there's people have less sick days, and you can get discounts on your health care insurance. So that um, is a, a cost savings that com comes back to the whole organization that may allow for... Um, Maybe it allows time for that fundraiser, that money can be shifted to give that fundraiser some professional development, right? Or maybe that time could be, that, that money that, uh, that's coming in through reduced healthcare costs can be applied to doing an innovation lab and to come up with more ideas. Um, the next thing area where it, um, it gives you a return on investment is in staff retention, okay? Uh, if any of you are hiring managers, you know how much time it takes to um, hire someone who's the right fit, get them up to speed, and make it work. Um, and uh, and we know what the downside is of staff turnover, which is pe other people are having to fill in. And we lose that kind of institutional uh, fluency and memory. And so if you have a culture of well-being, and it's a great place to work, um, people are not going to leave. <laughs> And sometimes innovative ideas come from those with have, who have great experience and are and have a great understanding of the organization and what they need. So if you're able to retain them, that's great. Um, and on the flip side of that, innovative ideas might come from new talent out there who um, may be looking at not they're not just looking at the job, but they're also and they're looking at the salary, yes, yes. They're looking at the job task, they're looking at the salary, but more and more we're seeing people look at what is the workplace culture. So if you want to attract um, the highest performing staff who are going to have those incredibly innovative ideas, then you also want to have a culture of well-being. There's also other um, benefits to it. Um, staff become are more effective champions when they're not burned out. And also, you know, there are times of stress as a fundraiser. I'm thinking year-end fundraising. <laughs> I don't know if that's stressful for you, Kristen. I know when I was a fundraiser, it sure, sure was um, uh, stressful or any campaign. And if you're able to have a culture of well-being and take care of yourself, then you're able to better uh, handle, handle those stressful times. So yeah, I don't know definitely. if that was... I think, uh, I think with events especially, I really appreciate at my nonprofit, you know, after we have an event, um, the entire team has a day off um, the day after, and it just allows everyone to kind of reset and um, do something for themselves after they've put in all this hard extra work. And there's not a lot of nonprofits that do those sorts of things, but it makes such a big difference. 
Right. And another thing, too, when you have that day off after the big campaign, to do something for yourself, it also gives you a time to do reflection on the campaign itself. And I think being able to reflect on, on a campaign that you've run to figure out what really worked and, and what didn't work and how can we improve it instead of jumping into the next campaign or a day full of back-to-back-to-back meetings, that will bring that experience into the next time you do it and it'll get better. Okay, moving along in the interest of time, I always want to keep my eye on this. I have a couple, I have two more polls. And, um, and uh, so the first one, let's see if we can move the mouse. Okay, so the first poll, I want to, uh, this is a scale of one to five, with five being the highest. In your organization, do employees have a strong sense of community at work or a collegial environment? And this is one of the characteristics of a culture of well-being. There are many, but, but we're going to just ask you a polling question about two of them, just to, you know, so you understand what they are. So the poll is up and people are answering. Um, I'm really glad, Beth, that you brought up how it helps to retain talent, because I know that's a struggle here in the Pacific Northwest right now, I think we have a two jobs for every one development person or fundraiser, and it's caused a lot of turnover. And I think that that's one of the things that nonprofits are starting to realize is that having these you know types of cultures is what's going to attract the right people and keep them um, because right. that turnover costs organizations so much money from year to year. Great. So do we have results yet? Not yet. <laughs> Here they come. Okay, so on a scale from one to five, it looks like 33% uh, said they were about a three of having a strong sense of community at work, 34% a four, 17% um, a two, and 16% to five. And we had nobody oh. said zero, so we're actually doing pretty well. Good, but, and I can see where we could do, we can also do better. So this is actually um, a key characteristic of a culture of well-being. As you can see, it's not a hard and fast black and white thing. A culture, culture change and creating a culture of well-being, you know, is maybe not, it, it, it's something that's a little bit intangible. intangible. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually skip this next poll because I'm keeping an eye on the time. And I want to like hop into actually breaking it down, uh, the components of creating a culture of well-being. So first, it rests with leadership um, because leaders have to model the behavior and they have to be supportive of wanting a culture of well-being. Because leadership, leaders have great power in organizations and their attitudes and their behavior is contagious. And we want to be spreading good things like a culture of well-being rather than toxic cultures. Um, the next thing, a cultural well-being, it's not something that's done onto employees. It's something that employees choose to engage with. It is a lot about workplace culture. Um, and, you know, there have been articles recently about very high-profile organizations who have gotten into trouble because of having toxic workplaces where there is harassment and other things that are not so great. Um, uh, it's you know, yes, we want to pay attention to the results, but we also want to pay attention to the way that we do the work, and that is workplace culture. Some of it is attitudinal, um, and some of it is process, and we'll talk about that in a moment. And then having programs, act activities, cues, policies, and an overall strategy is important. I think uh, the good thing is that I think compared to other things that you can do, having a... a um, it's something that you can work on and, um, and continually improve and get better. So one of the things that I would recommend is not going to the tactics right away, like, you know, yoga in the conference room. Avoid those, you know, quick fixes. I mean, you could, if you have a building with an elevator, you could download um, from the CDC an elevator wrap, wrapper that says take the stairs. But if your stairs... Um, uh, take the stairs, get exercise. But if your um, staircases look like this and filled with rats and cockroaches, no one's going to take the stairs. This is a true story, actually, from a nonprofit 
where they were trying to get employees, let's do walks, let's use the stairs and sell the elevator. Nobody bothered to look at the stair stairways and <laughs> and they're filled with rats. Um, they ended up moving and they've created a great atmosphere and environment in their office. Um, and they took a close look at all the stairwells of the potential offices they were going to move into. And they do now have employees walking up and down stairs. So, um, so one example comes from the crisis text line, which is a uh, crisis text line uh, for teens that are in crisis. And they can text in and get a counselor. Um, on page one of their employee handbook, everybody is required to have a self-care plan. Um, and they are not only evaluated on their job performance, but how well they also are taking care of themselves. And, um, and they do things that you know, also focus on culture. Um, for example, they have Toto Tuesdays, where they play the song Toto Africa very loudly on Tuesday afternoons, and everyone gets to leave the office early to take care of um, some personal and have personal time. Everybody does it, including the executive director. Um, so here's an example that has some focus on really kind of shifting some culture. It comes from Philanthropy University um, that comes out of uh, UC Berkeley and the Haas School. And this is their team. It's a small team. You can see Colin, who is their uh, executive director. And uh, they noticed that their meetings were kind of <laughs> looking like this. Everyone was on their devices and distracted. And it, it just didn't feel good. Um, so. Uh, so he started a program where he had quarterly themes um, to really work uh, on, on creating a great positive culture. So the, this quarterly theme was on mindfulness and asking about behaviors, norms, and processes that they can establish to engender more mindfulness and presence in their interactions with each other. And one of the things they came up with was the uh, technology detox box. Um, so when they had meetings that didn't require technology, they put the box out and people drop their phones and their devices in the bag and actually talk to one another <laughs> and have, you know, a meeting. Now, I'm not saying that technology is bad. Um, it could also have a positive influence on the culture. This comes from an uh, organization called Lightful in London. And there are a new organization, a lot of younger people. They're very Slack heavy. They use the program Slack. A very, they've had full digital transformation. But one of the things they said that we're growing so fast, we don't know people in other departments. So they created this thing called the Donut Bot, which uh, randomly matches different people in the organization to have um, coffee each week. Um, so they could get to know each other as, as people and to sort of break, start to break down some of the silos that were forming in their organization. Uh, another example comes from the United Way of South Dakota. And I'm going to actually encourage everybody to stand up while I'm telling this story and stretch and take a break with me. And I'm actually doing it. If you saw me on camera, you would see me moving. And so this was the uh, United Way of South Dakota, twice daily off staff walk um, or do movement. And it started with listening and engaging with the employees and asking them what they needed. And they said, we need to have more breaks in our day where we can do exercise. So every day at 10 o'clock and it's in the morning at two o'clock in the morning, they ring a bell, everybody gets up and does a group stretch or they walk around the office. They're in South Dakota, if it's nice, nice time of year, they'll go outside. And this started 10 years ago as an experience, um, experiment and now it's a part of the culture and they even get people who want to uh, apply for jobs there because they heard they have this great um, culture there and uh, uh, they allow people to get movement and exercise during the day. So also in your handouts, if you want to get this process started on your, uh, on your uh, fundraising team or within your organization, I have kind of a recipe that you can do a kind of a mini staff retreat. Um, uh, discussing these uh, uh, areas that relate to a culture of well-being and to come up with um, uh, different uh, pilots uh, that you could test. So with that, I'm going to summarize by saying self-care is part of doing the work. Understand um, if you're burning out and depleting your passion for changing the world without refueling. Self-care is really about um, intentional uh, habit change and self-awareness and well-being. The workplace starts with you. And pick one self-care habit that you can create and build into your life today and encourage others in your organization or community to do the same. So with that, I'm going to just pause, <laughs> Kristen, and see if we have any questions. We actually have some great questions. So um, 
one was from Denise and she was saying she really is enjoying some of the, you know, subtle humor that you have in your deck and, and that you're, you know, obviously working into the workplace, but how would you suggest um, implementing humor as part of this into like your team culture? Oh, that's such a great question. <laughs> um, you know, and it's reminding me of a study that says one of the best ways to reduce stress is to laugh. <laughs> Um, and, um, and I, I think it depends too. I mean, this is, I don't know if the person who asked the question is the leader, um, cause it could also be something that the leader does to introduce kind of laughing at, at themselves or maybe kicking off the meeting with everybody, you know, ask them to bring their favorite comic about a, um, you know, related to fundraising or to share, um, something funny, something, you know, the last thing that made them smile. I mean, one great thing, I don't know if all of you are doing this, is just is to have rituals in the workplace, and that can, you know, lead to well-being. And some rituals can just be, you know, how you start meetings. Sometimes we just start them, we just dive in, you know, and we start doing the work, or we just start the agenda, and we don't do, like, an icebreaker or a check-in of kind of formal starting the meeting, get everybody centered. I do this with a lot of organizations I work with, and so um, you could actually start with um, something that made you smile. <laughs> in the last week or putting a cute um, animal gift <laughs> on your, um, you know, at the beginning of your um, presentation if you're, for your meeting, lots of different ways. Um, but I think great. it begins with modeling, modeling the behavior. Yeah. Then we seem to have uh, quite a few questions um, related to like if you're trying to implement some of your own time blocking or time to check emails or things like that and your coworkers aren't necessarily on board so they may be causing interruptions or things like that. Um, what would be your suggestion for that? I know even for me telling my coworkers I'm working from home one day a week, they still were kind of jumping in and scheduling calls and things that day. So what would be your suggestion? Okay, so, okay, this is about managing boundaries on the one hand and the telling people this, I, you know, I have this time focus, I need to get this done. Um, uh, so I'm not gonna be able to um, answer you during this period, but I am available later in the day uh, for questions. So it's really kind of, uh, in a nice way, managing uh, the boundaries. It's also like similar to managing like a chatty colleague. You know, you know, you do the chit chat, but it lasts a little bit too long. So it's like, wow, I'd love to be able to talk to you today, but um, you know, but I need to get this focused work done. Um, if it's electronic interruptions, there are programs like Inbox When Ready that sends a message out that says, I'm, you know, I'm on a tight deadline today. I'm not responding. I'm not looking at my email until after 3 p.m. If this is an emergency, please give me a call. Uh, when you have an open office space, that can lead to a lot of distractions. And here you really have to um, uh, have everybody involved. And that's um, around... I've seen organizations handle it with discussions and then have signage on the wall that says, watch people's body language, don't interrupt, you know, notice your voice level, volume, um, all those kinds of things. Uh, I know some organizations have gone as far as having a staff meeting, and, um, and I can put a link to this, um, have everybody talk about their working style and what their cue is for when they're open to interruptions or not. Some organizations do things with like having um, colored cups outside their door or on their desk. A red cup is I'm concentrating. A yellow is ask first. And green cup is come on and, you know, interrupt me. And, but everybody has to be on the same page around using that. That's great. So, so two things in summary, like having boundary management skills yourself, but also a group agreement around that. Awesome. Well, one of the things I always love about your presentations and workshops, Beth, is that you always share a bit.ly link with all of the resources. So I encourage everyone to write the bit.ly link down that you have on the screen now uh, because it has all of your handouts, all of your information, and it's just fantastic to be able to follow up with those things after the webinar. So thank you so much. This has all been really helpful. If we didn't get to your questions, um, we will be following up with them um, afterwards um, in the follow-up. 
And we hope that we've left you wanting more. Uh, the second edition of Cause Selling, a guide to relationship-driven fundraising is now available on Amazon and Kindle. You can go to causeselling.org to snag a free first chapter today. And like Beth mentioned, there are some of those um, materials or information in there on how do you deal with donor fatigue um, and taking care of your donors as well. So if that's something you were interested in, definitely make sure that you order the book. And then uh, selfish plug, uh, don't miss our next webinar. It's actually going to be with me on the magical force of major gift donors on October 16th um, at 11 a.m. Uh, Pacific Standard Time. So I really hope that you all will come there. Major gift donors are so critical to our fundraising and it's actually one of my favorite things to talk about um, related to fundraising. I want to just thank you all to the audience for taking the time today. We, we've talked about how important it is to take time for yourself, and we're glad that you took time to do this webinar today with Beth. We hope you got some wonderful, helpful tips that you'll actually put those tips into action. And to help us continue to improve our monthly webinar series, um, we, we also hope that you will complete our survey and give us your feedback. In closing, we hope that you enjoy the rest of your day and thank, for, thank you all for all that you do to make better communities in which we live, work, and play. And I look forward to seeing you October 16th. Thank you so much.